I'm ready. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 everybody. Ryan Roxy here. Welcome to another live stream edition of In the Trenches podcast with Ryan Roxy. I am your host. Uh, what is happening today? I'll tell you. Look at I'm I'm in a world of red right now. A world of red. I'm actually in a world of excitement because it's not every day that uh, I get to bring on the show true influences and there's no lie about this. This is a rock and roll influence that has uh, influenced many a band, especially yours truly, um, for just playing ballsy punk rock and roll straight ahead. I, there's so many ways to describe rock and roll, whether, whether it's with attitude and punk. This man has all of that, and he's been kicking ass for years. I want to invite in the trenches. Would you please welcome Michael Monroe? Hello, Michael. Hello, hello. Hey, Ryan. How you doing? <laughs> hello, everybody. You We're in the trenches. Ryan Roxy. Talk about this and that. <laughs> We had a rock and roll. Talk about all that crap, yay! <laughs> With the lockdown blues. <laughs> we've, we've got a new theme song already. That's it. It just it, we got our own special theme song for today. Michael Monroe is our guest on In the Trenches. If you are listening to this on a regular podcast, you might want to uh, visualize it and get over to uh, YouTube or Facebook Live because right now. You've got the man, uh, not the myth. He's definitely the legend, uh, Michael Monroe, with us today. We have to talk about so many things. Like we, we had a little chat yesterday when we were doing our sound check. Folks, we did a sound check for this. But uh, the, the one main thing we wanted to sort of get out of this is that we want to hype up the new album, One Man Gang, and the newest video, Last Train to Tokyo. And I see that you're a little bit frozen there. I hope that doesn't mean that you're frozen for good. Um, are you there, Michael? Michael's frozen. Okay. So what we do now when this stuff is sort of things happen, nobody panics, nobody freaks out because this is the internet and it is the days that we're doing it. Um, Michael, let's see if we can remove you and then bring you back on when he comes back on and uh, we will see what we can do technically. So Michael will probably be calling me in just a second because these things happen. We know it, and we don't freak out. Out of the gate, it was good, right, though? If we don't have anything left, we at least have that intro. Right, Vic? <laughs> so we're going to bring on to the screen real quick because I think uh, Michael's going to try and sign on again. And if he can sign on with his uh, telephone, it will happen. But uh, Vic, come on to the – that's our producer. So, if you, you know, all the accolades that Vic gets – Hey, or, get or us out of this deserved. one. <laughs> Come on. I've this got some videos. Our... We can watch some videos. Well, there you go. You can watch a few videos. Maybe we can even hype it up while we're waiting for uh, Michael to get back on the air. And you'll see if I can. I'll call him during this. But we can see if we can watch a little bit of a video. Have little short clips. I've got, I've got a clip of him okay. playing. Hold on. Um, I've got him on the phone. We knew it would happen. No worries. So do you want to go back in and repeat that process of the sign-in? Yeah. Okay. What, 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 all right. Don't worry. That stuff happens all the time. Don't worry. And in fact, you've got a lot of adoring fans and adoring supporters that are, are willing to hang on the line for a little bit. We're going to play a little bit of a video, the new video, while we sort out the technical difficulties. What do you say, Vic? You want to do that? And, uh, and let's see what we can do about sorting you out. I'm going to mute my mic. So there you go. I am back now. I think I'm back. Let me get back on there, Vic. Can you get my face on there at least? Okay, Vic. Hey, hey. Hello. 
There I am. Yeah. So that last clip was last train to Tokyo. And guess what? Michael took the first train from Finland onto the Into Trenches podcast, but somehow got derailed. But then he got back mm-hmm. on with us. Hey. Story mom. of my life. I'm not, I'm not user friendly. I told you. <laughs> and wasn't that going to be one of the music titles that we had for like a new, I, 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 you said it, but then I suggested, you know what? You need to write a song called not user friendly because. Yeah. I used that line in a song in 96. I'm not user friendly. Drugs trying to use me. Computers trying to program me. Uh, uh, and, uh, I'm not user friendly. I used that line, but it could be a title. And, uh, because these days, I mean, when you get to a show, usually backstage, you get somebody's in the old days, somebody always says, anybody got a line? Are you holding? You know, <laughs> and nowadays it's, are you online? What's the yeah. password? Yeah. Anyone and got they, a they password? Check the fe- <laughs> yeah. And then they used to check the females. Now they check the emails. Damn. So there's some lyrics for this. I'm not user friendly. <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah. Michael, if you weren't, if you weren't already, uh, it- a uh, legendary frontman, you could easily be a heavyweight boxer because you have all the lines of Muhammad Ali, huh? <laughs> yeah, like a butterfly, like, sting like a bee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little Richard was the king of all that, you know. Oh man, cool. yeah, well, I created rock and roll. Didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and uh, and Prince, what did he say? Prince, baby, I had a purple Cadillac before you was born, baby. And uh, <laughs> he is such a classic. Little Richard, still today, the best rock and roll singer of all time. I got to tell you, in my books. Anyway. Why not? Why not just dive all the way back? Because you know what, I you're. I thought you were uh, a few years older than me, and I'm right. I'm not. You know, no one has to say. You know, the, they're I'm 57. Real age. I'm 57. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I was okay. So I'm three years younger, right? So you're just you just got the edge on me just by a little bit. But I was. I was uh, fanboying out to Hanoi Rocks Records and sort of getting my image groomed and basically all of Southern California's image groomed back in those early days. But, you know, that three-year edge that you guys had on all of the bands, I I do say that if there wasn't a a Michael Monroe and a Hanoi Rocks, there probably would not be a Guns N' Roses or a hair metal scene. Could you maybe take a little bit of credit? I know you're a very humble guy, but take a little credit for that. Well, um, Guns N' Roses probably would have existed, but uh, maybe not in exactly the same way. But uh, I mean, they took influences in a good way. I think they're they're and they, they always talked about Hanoi, and it was great. I I love those guys. Thank God for them. Yeah, I mean, but the hair metal thing. Uh, there were some good bands, but then there were a lot of bands that kind of missed the point in my book that were more into the hair and big hair. And I never, first of all, I never even wanted a big hair. I just, my hair was boring and straight. So I started back combing, which I don't do. I haven't done for years. I just wanted a little more fluffy, you know. Yeah. And then and sometimes it was so long. It looked, <laughs> kind of, it looked like Johnny Thunders in the New York Dolls' first album cover. Uh, but see, to us, it was about music and the attitude is more punky, more punk than. Uh, than this posing thing, but uh, I mean, yeah, it's flattering, and uh, uh, I'm—I must have done something right, and uh, no, it's great like to have having have an influence. But it's Guns N' Roses, especially, they got the point right, and they had their own thing, and that's why they were so uh, so uh, so strong because uh, they had their own own personality, but they took were influenced in the right way, like we did too. We did, we got influenced yeah. by everybody from Little Richard to the Rolling Stones to the Ramones. Yeah. And, and, uh, and like you said, you even mentioned album covers that you guys looked at and sort of studied as we did. Uh, obviously, New York Dolls albums covers and, and you know, we obviously studied. The uh, Heartbreakers, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. and Of course, the, of course. The, the forefathers of punk. But uh, yeah, I mean, with this uh, hair metal thing, which I was always, I was blamed for. <laughs> blamed for. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I mean, of course, uh, you know, it's nice to have people, uh, you know, uh, Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery and all that, but uh, you know, it's not about sex and drugs, rock and roll. You know, to me, it was such cliches. Uh, so I sort of wrote a song called Dead Jail or Rock and Roll, it was more like realistic. And uh, it ain't no fun and games, and it's not about partying and having chicks, as you know, to me, anyways. I mean, I've never been with a groupie in my life, I could never imagine spending a night oh. with a complete stranger and then having you know, some stranger maybe have my baby or something. You know, I just maybe because I'm Finnish, you know, I was brought up. <laughs> normally more normal than uh most rockers think that's normal that's like yeah you know chicks and all that 
mo a lot of guitarists or rock musicians in America say they started playing music to get, to get chicks. I'm like, what? I'm glad they could play a little on the side, you know, while they're chasing <laughs> the girls. <laughs> you know, I was like, so to me, it was about music, you know, and uh, it was really that first and foremost, you know, I was. I'll be honest. On the I, I was fifty-fifty. I think I, I, it was about the chicks for me. Yeah, yeah but, I, but yeah. then again, I'm that I'm that kid from Northern California. But yeah. you know what, Michael. <laughs> You are the MythBuster. You are now the rock and roll MythBuster because just in that one little soliloquy of of talking, you have just basically busted a bunch of rock and roll myths, which is really important because there's a reason why I'm interviewing Michael Monroe when I was looking at his album covers in the early '80s, whether it was you know. Uh, Back to Mystery City, or of course the Bob Ezrin produced uh, album. Two steps from the you're, you're pretty foul, pretty proud of that album. Two steps, Two steps from, from the move. move. Yeah. yeah. So there's a reason I'm sitting here talking to you, and we're still both here. We've been in the trenches of rock and roll. Obviously, yeah. you you've been really, really, you know, down up. You've been in helicopters in your videos. I know that, but you've I've been always in, hell, uh, <laughs> in helicopters and in hell and back <laughs> to hell and back many a times. And I'm still here to listen to everyone tell me about it. <laughs> but the thing you have is this: what is this PMA? Is that is that what kind of gets you through everything? Because I read that somewhere where you have this go positive ahead. mental attitude. Please explain that and what it's all about, because I think that's so important to your success and to success of people that really try to make it in this business, right? Well, yeah. Well, you try to concentrate on the positive more than the negative, because the the more you, what you concentrate on usually tends to mu multiply. And to me, you know, if you concentrate on how everything sucks and all that, then then life is going to start, start sucking for real. So I figure it's best to just, uh, you know, try to focus on the positive and uh, make the best out of life. And uh, I'm happy. It doesn't take a lot, take a lot to make me happy. I never dreamed about mansions and limousine services and then being a millionaire. I just wanted to make a living out of being a rocker, but uh, you know, by doing what I love doing the most, I started out in the streets uh, of Stockholm with Hanoi rocks. We, me and Sammy Alpha and nasty suicide the first half a year. We lived on the streets, homeless, but I was happy because I had nothing to lose, and I I, I, was, <laughs> I can make a living. I don't even need a need a home, you know. And <laughs> once I got a roof over my head, I was like, "Wow, this is luxury." So you know, that's where it started. And the only way to go was up. And uh, as long as I didn't compromise my integrity, I was being honest, played from the heart, and true to myself, and not compromise for the wrong reasons. Nobody could ever blackmail me, but you know, or extort me with money or anything like that. Because I said, "You can keep your money. I don't need it," you know. So. That's why I, you know, that was my basis for the whole thing. And if you do it for the right reasons, therefore, nobody can take it away from you. What you have, nobody can take away from you. If you take a shortcut and you cheat, then you're you're not on such a solid foundation. So to me, I said, okay, no one, no one could make me do what I don't want to do, and no one could take take away from me what I have. And there had to be at least one band or artist that that wouldn't do just anything for money, because uh, you know it would be too easy to sell out and. To a fault, I've been true to my principles, and a lot of people say, "Are you crazy?" You, you know, uh, why? You know, I could have made it. Of course, I could have made it a little bit easier myself. Uh, I was so, <laughs> it was so important to me to stay true to my beliefs and my, you know, what I thought. You know, you're true I to mean, everything. You know, when 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 I, when I folks when, when we did our sound check yesterday, and we we you know with Michael Monroe, it, it does sort of the image does go hand in hand because you have such a strong rock and roll image. But that's who you are. It's not a it's not a pose. It's not mm -hmm. it's not fake. You know, even had an album title name, not fake in it, right? Yeah. And <laughs> and you know, this is you. 24 mm -hmm. 7 because when we did the sound check yesterday maybe you had a tiny bit less eye, eye makeup on but not much and and you 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 look pretty much exactly the same as when we sound checked yesterday when no cameras were on or when no nobody was live streaming yeah so you thought i was dressed up already <laughs> 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 thank you yeah i mean this is me i figured i could be you know i don't put on a uniform to go on stage and uh well, Alice Cooper said it when when he said about talked about Jim Morrison saying like Jim Morrison died because he was trying to be Jim Morrison twenty four hours, but he had a heavy image, you know, self destruction and all that. So I decided I could be this twenty four seven without the self destruction, you know, right, right. <laughs> just you know, just like I do. And uh, well, I wear, I wear makeup every day, and you know, just just for myself, you know, I, this is the way I am. It's the way I li like to look. So uh, 
you know, it doesn't have to be, a, a, you know, an act. Well, you know, but you, I'm for real anyway. But please tell me, have you ever done the splits in public? The splits? <laughs> Yeah, have you ever in done public? the public? Yes, on stage. No, what I know do you you've mean? done it on stage. I know you do. You do it on stage. In fact, that's one of the things that uh, it, that's more than inspiring. It's uh, <laughs> that, that I look up with your with your live performance. But have you ever done the splits just for no reason in public? Well, sometimes people say, "Ah, come on, Michael, do the splits." And uh, <laughs> some some occasions, uh, I've taken photos. For example, with. Um, uh, with with Cheryl Cooper, we did the splits uh, next to the stage at the Swindon show, uh, and she's on the video. She's on for a couple of seconds. You can see that on the video of our our song going down with the ship. We both doing the splits next to the stage uh, right. during the solo. I think it was. I asked as Cheryl's permission. She said, "Of course." We always do the splits together. <laughs> so for various reasons, I may do them off stage as well, and that was a good reason because it's can still do the splits. Of course, yeah, you know, let's go. <laughs> And Cheryl is so wonderful. I love her. She's uh, amazing. You know, imagine talk about being in good shape for you know. Of course. For how long you've been on the planet? She's that been. Is, she's so. been doing all that stuff and all those. But I gotta out. tell you, I gotta Go tell you this though. Some in so many interviews, people say, "So Michael, when you can't do the splits anymore, uh, how are you gonna you know are you gonna give up your career? What am I a circus act? I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah. I'm a singer first and foremost, so I think I'll still be able to sing. And and I remember, <laughs> hey, you can do a, a, a sort of version of it, just a, maybe a, lo a longer leg stretch, because I did go see um, who who was it, Chuck Berry, in his later years, and of course, wow. yeah, of course, he's playing all these. I saw him in Stockholm, and he's playing, wow. you know, all the hits. But of course, everybody's waiting for the duck walk. But let me tell you. Uh -huh. When he finally did do that 2.1 seconds of duck walk, the place went mad. So I think if you even just spread your legs wider apart for one song, you know, when, when, when you're like not in your 90s, all right, this is way, way long, you know. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's a good it's a good kind of curse for me, a curse in, in quotes, because I have to stay in shape to be able to do what I do. Exactly. And I have to, it has to look easy on stage, right? Yeah. I mean, you, nobody wants to see a guy with a beer belly huffing and puffing with a face all red and sweating. And, ooh, you know, you know, it's it's got to look easy, and uh, therefore I have to stay in shape to be able to do what I what I do for a living. So, hopefully, hopefully, knock on wood, that'll uh, mean that I'll live a healthy, long life. I hope. Well, it goes hand dying. in hand with you. It goes hand in hand with you being a front man, and and also, you know, having such a rock and roll iconic uh, symbol with you, which is the saxophone, which you play the hell out of, by the way, and the harmonica. Those are the two instruments, I think. Well, sa saxophone, you've taken it on to, to another level by yourself, I feel. But but harmonica is kind of like a, a singer's rock and roll sort of handgun. I think, you know, Alice plays a little harmonica in 18. I know T Steven Tyler. Yeah, harmonica. yeah he played on, was, uh, on the Generation was, Landslide. That got you guys... What was it that got you to those early performers that inspired you to be the sort of front man that you are today and, you know, take on those other instruments? Was it Tyler or was it, you know, more punk rockers as well, but or a combination of all of them? It was like Little Richard, uh, also Steven Tyler, uh, but Little Richard, uh, saxophone. I started playing the sax when I figured, you know, it's part of rock and roll, like the piano. Uh, mm -hmm. I went and bought a sax, uh, the coasters, you know, uh, and uh, Junior Walker, uh, Clarence Clemens was an inf influence on that. But I just started going for the 50s raspy sound, you know, like the, the Wanderer, you know, with that, that kind of. And that's kind of my shtick. Um, uh, King but it ain't Curtis, it yakety ain't yak. It's, you know the instrument. You know the instrument really well. It ain't like you're not like a one trick pony with it. You have actually done a lot of different you know, a lot of playing on it, you know, especially yeah, I even early did, Hanoi's. Go ahead. Yeah, and even recently there's a there's a Finnish girl group that is three girls who sing like, you know, three-part harmonies that were, uh, I played some sax on their record. They did mellow saxophone. That's a hard, hard riff to do. It's kind of jazz, you know. So I like to visit different areas, but I think I play a better harp than a sax. I don't practice sax that much, but uh, I guess I should improve my sax life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, but you know that the harp is so, so <laughs> yeah right. Uh, the harp is so much easier. It's so much easier to carry along with you. You always have a harp, and uh, I play blues punk. You know, my that's my style. Blues <laughs> punk of harmonica. I like it. Yeah. 
<laughs> man. So yeah. I, I know that you've I know that you've actually played harmonica on some GNR's albums as well, right? Yeah, yeah. If you go if you see in the back there is a, a gold record of uh, I don't want to lose that internet. I don't want to lose don't move that computer. <laughs> it's all, all over backwards. Yeah, back there you can see when I they had so three million Use your illusion album back there, mm, <laughs> wherever it is. Yep, uh, they it. sent me this uh, triple platinum record. That I, was, I played on a song called Bad Obsession. Uh, I played some harp and saxophone on that. Mm-hmm. And uh, th- th- that was um, 1990 yeah. or 91, something like that. Uh, yeah. And played the harp and the sax, actually a sax section. Right on that but uh what was your question again <laughs> i know I, my, my question was that i you know a lot of times people think that okay because we we play in different rock and roll bands everybody must know each other they know each other for years there's this sort of fraternity of rock and roll and a lot of times we don't meet people until either later in lay way later in years or we meet them very briefly at a um, uh, festival or something like that and and you and i yeah. sort of initially met I, I told you yesterday we met in the late 80s when we both lived in new york city yeah and, uh it was w- during the album uh, not faking it and i and my singer shane introduced me to you we went up to the studio we listened to some mixes you were really excited about those mixes you were you know uh, yeah i i can say this in a tongue-in-cheek way you were grinding it out in the studio <laughs> during those, uh-huh. and, you, and you were and you were really excited to to release that album and you had yet to meet Axel Rose. And yet, when you guys did the taping for the Dead Jailer Rock and Roll uh, video, there was Axel. And so I want to I talk about that first time you guys met and how did it all go down? Oh, yeah. Well, we were shooting the video for Dead Jailer Rock and Roll, the song that was going to be the first single. That's what was the first single in the video for not, the not Faking It album. Right. And I had just signed worldwide solo deal with Polygram Records, and uh, we had, the plan was to shoot it in uh, the Alphabet City. You know, be, uh, there was a, there was this empty lot between Third and Fourth Street, and uh, I think it was between Avenue E and D. Yeah, it was really far up there, like a real crack heroin area. You know, and, and, so, and now it's luxury. <laughs> now you now can't even afford idea. to look at it. <laughs> oh yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it used to be. Uh, it became like a shanty town at some point. The, the homeless people built their own little shacks there, like you I know, cardboard that. boxes. They live, yeah. And then by nowadays, the, it's it like by, by the Lismore Lounge, was it? Wasn't it by Lismore Lounge and that? Lismore Lounge, area? yeah. That's that Lismore Lounge is a little higher up. That was more closer to Tompkins Square, uh-huh. which which used to be also a heavy area. And uh, I remember Iggy used to live by on uh, I think it was Tenth Street. And uh, yeah, well, there's the there's well, my that, flat. Hey. It, okay. <laughs> Now, talk, my talk, East Third Street, Hell's talk, Angels. Okay, before we get into the Guns and Roses or the the Axl Rose meeting, you actually lived next door to the Hell's Angels, so you definitely had some friends in in higher or lower places, whatever you want to look at. But this, oh is- yeah, see this <laughs> the the picture with me jumping up. You can see my the, the second the not the highest floor, but the second to highest floor, the gray building. There's the, the fire escape. That was my those were my windows. Those four windows, my living my bedroom and my living room. And you can see the 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 court where the where the flag is rigged up. Uh, my friend Eddie from the Hells Angels, I was on their good side. I went to introduce myself when I moved into the block. I lived there for ten years, and they were watching the street, you know, twenty four hour watch. I lived across the street, and uh, my friend Eddie from the Angels, he, he knocked on my door that morning. The Fourth of July party. They used to block off the street for two days and nights, and there were like fireworks. All there was like downtown Beirut. Uh, I don't mean the club. I mean the, the, the bar. I mean, I mean, like really war zone, and you could come by at your own risk. And they, my friend Eddie, came knocking on my door that morning and says, "Yo, Mike, can you use your fire escape?" And they, I said, "Yeah, sure, go ahead." And they, there was another angel on the other side of the street in the other building, and they rigged up the American flag like that, and then their logo. So when you look from the end of the block, you see Hell's Angels, New York City. No doubt whose uh, whose block it was, and also their vice president. Uh, this guy Teddy, he was a big fan of Bruce Springsteen's, and uh, I was at uh, Little Steve, Little Steve and Van Zandt, very important, uh, yeah. uh, very my best friend in New York when we lived there. He uh, he was doing a show. I love his solo stuff, Voice of America. That album was just like a Absolutely. very important for me. And uh, his second solo album, No Compromise, No Regrets, had a song called Native American, which is a duet with Bruce. So Bruce came to sing that duet with him at the Ritz, the old Ritz on 11th Street. That was a great venue. 
I remember so that. I was at that show, and uh, as I was trying, I was, you know, I had met Bruce through uh, Stephen, of course, at the, the Sun City project, which was in 85 when I actually decided to move to New York. When I was part of that video, uh, you know, we didn't get the Sun City. You remember that? that of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, make people aware of this South African situation. Uh, you were in that I video met, as well. Uh, that's yeah, great. and I uh, I met Bruce, you know, through Stephen. So uh, I was leaving the club, and the Hell's Angels vice president was downstairs at the bar, saying like, uh, with another angel, said, "Yo, Mike, you have a drink with us uh, before you go." And I said, "Yeah, what are you doing here?" He says, "Oh, I want to see Bruce because he, he knew that Bruce was going to walk by there as he was leaving the club." So when Bruce came by, I pulled him his sleeve. I said, "Would you say hi to my friend?" You know, so I introduced Bruce Springsteen to the vice president of the Hell's Angels, and Bruce is so nice. He talked to him for like at least a half an hour at the bar there. So <laughs> there was like. After that, you can see that. All right, Mike, whatever you need, just stick your head out the window. <laughs> I so it. I was like, uh, you know, uh, situations like that, you know, normal person doesn't usually end up in. And I've been privileged to, uh, I, you know, there was never a dull moment in that block. And, uh, you know, the bikes were loud. It's the loudest and the safest block in the city. The, the Nelson Mandela <laughs> of a rock and roll, Michael Monroe, bringing people together. <laughs> I love it. Man. <laughs> No, no, if you're gonna no, bring up fun. South Africa, you know we gotta bring it Nelson Mandela. Yeah, I mean <laughs> that whole thing in Sun City, all these people that were involved in that project, you know, from Miles Davis to Keith Richards to you know Bob Dylan and Bob yeah. Geldof, Bono, everybody, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nona Hendrix, uh, Peter Wolf, the, the uh, Run DMC, all the coolest and, and biggest names in rock were part of that thing. Isn't Ringo Starr, Zach Starkey, uh, you know, uh, Eddie Kendricks. Uh, there was. Um, uh, you know, Hall of Notes, uh, it, it, so many cool Everybody. big names that yeah. Steven got together. Yeah, and Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel and all those people for the same thing. Ang let's, you know, ain't going to play Sun City. I don't care what you pay. It was the holiday it's resort in up. South Africa where a lot of bands went to play. They were paid millions, incredible amounts of money. But then they were supporting the racist government at the time. Mandela was still in jail. So and that I was the first. ended right after that. Yeah, right. that was that. What really worked out good because after that, no bands could go there and play with a with a clear conscience, and uh, that was my first move after Hanoi Rocks had broken up. I moved to New York. That's we came to see the do the video in uh, uh, in New York uh, uh, that Stephen was shooting at uh, Washington Square Park, and that's when I decided this is my kind of. I'm going to start over after Hanoi. You know, Razzle had died and all. I, I wanted to start my you know, life over and started my solo career by moving to New York in 1985, the end of 85. And uh, that's how, uh, you know, I started my, restarted my career as a solo artist after that whole that's thing. And, uh, yeah. I was proud. and we I met then. And I was proud to be part of that. And we had, I remember Shane. Yeah, yeah. Shane mm -hmm. and uh, Sandra, Sandra Weber, the, who made Clothing some designer. amazing clothes. She, she made some, so she made this crushed velvet jacket for me. It's like violet and black and it was, Beautiful, handmade, you know, all these pearls and everything. It was incredible. Well, hey, wow, look at these photos. <laughs> uh, look at me and Steve Baders and uh, me and Steve Baders and Lemmy on the bottom there. Oh my Tri God. We're like the triple threat, you know? There was That's no speed trio. left for anyone. There was no speed left for anyone, anyone, <laughs> anyone in London. We took it all. <laughs> we did it all. We did it all. <laughs> let no, me ask, I mean, let me ask you this: all these photos that we that we're looking at, just so people know, you can't find a lot of them on the internet because they are kind of exclusive to your autobiography that's available in Finnish, right? Right now, it, it's not yeah, currently it's in, in English or <laughs> Japanese, but that's the Finnish version, folks. But uh, can we get full screen? Can we get a full screen of us there, Vic? Because well, that's the photos. The, the photos are good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is. Uh, but there's you know, the book. Michael Monroe autobiography. That's uh, about five hundred pages. It's really, and it's got those photos are in here. From the color spreads are. That's what I just. That's what you were looking at there. Yeah. So when when did now when did this come out in Finland and. Uh, is it is it going to be come out, coming out in? It came uh, out in Finland. Well, ahead. it came out in Finland in uh, 2011, and then there's an updated version version that came out uh, 2013, not actually 2014 or something. And it doesn't really. It hasn't been. It hasn't been translated. There's a there's a Hanoi Rocks book that was that is um, in All English, years, that, right? Yeah, and that was the same guy who wrote the, this book. Had never written a book in his life until until uh, he did the Hanoi book, and then my book. After that, he convinced me to do my book. After I, uh, I was kind of like, well, 
what have I got to say? And all. And he said, well, I have a lot of stories. I said, well, I guess I do. Yeah. Oh, so we started doing it. I, I'm so telling it was, you, it was right a labor now, of love. With this podcast, there's going to have to be a part two because we just don't have enough. We don't have enough internet Wi-Fi right now to to, to <laughs> complete show i think because there is so I many i want to get to because i mean we obviously went we're still in new york i want to still bring our listeners back to living in new york you're, yeah you're, the guns are roses thing too and yeah your manager says hey there's uh there's this band and uh there's this band called guns and roses that you obviously knew of each other but you had never met officially and he goes the, the singer wants to she wants to come down to the video shoot or how did that work out and no it was actually axel was just happened to be in new york at the time and we were making a video and we were going to shoot the video at this lot in the uh, lower east side in the alphabet city uh at this empty lot but then you know there was i said what if it rains and the, the, the scott galbert uh god bless his soul uh, uh he's passed on now was built in the video he says no it's not gonna rain and that, that was it was the worst downpour of rain for like 50 years or something. It was like incredible. It's just raining so bad that we had to change the plan. So there was no plan B. But luckily, they had the Uptown SIR had a, the sound stage was available. So we moved the whole thing up there. They were handing out flyers to get all these people there to get get an audience to that that stage room. And uh, right. we were shooting a video. And Axel happened to be just he was in a you know stopping by the deli in the corner to get a sandwich or something. And he asked, what's going on here? There's all these police cars and stuff. And he says, somebody said, it's Michael Monroe shooting a video. So it's, oh, wow. So he came to, he wanted to introduce himself. And he came to say, hi, I was, I was in a Winnebago, Vega getting makeup done. And he was uh, knocked on the door and he just said, hi, I'm Axel. And I say, hey, come on in. How you doing, man? At, yeah, let's go. Stay, that, uh, let's see later at the shoot that, uh, you know, he seemed like a nice guy. And we got along great. And uh, then uh, he was standing outside drinking beer, talking to people. It was really, really a, <laughs> so like, yeah, he's a nice guy. And I, I said, come on in. At the, maybe you like this song. He says, he heard the album, not faking it. He had had like an advanced cassette. Right. And he said, really liked it. I says, oh, uh, I've heard you sing. Uh, you must like that McCafferty from Nazareth. So I says, oh, yeah. So he was a big fan of Nazareth. And, uh, uh, and he said he used to listen to Love Hurts in secrecy in his bathroom because his parents wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't uh, approve of rock and roll. So, so it was like pretty heavy for him to, where he grew up. And, uh, I said, well, you must like the album because I'm not faking it. It's a Nazareth song. So he says, oh, it is a Nazareth song? And so he didn't even know that not faking it was a Nazareth song because that album was never that big in, um, in uh, well, there's the cover. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Hello, you fucks. <laughs> so uh, uh, he's, he's, uh, he said, oh, wow. He didn't know. Now he likes it even more because it was a Nazareth song. Loud and Proud, the album that that song was on, was apparently was never that big in the States, right? Exactly. It was more like Hair of the Dog and stuff like that. So, so we when got on so great. We had soundcheck. When you told me that for soundcheck, I was like, "No, I didn't know either that that not faking it was uh, named after a Nazareth song on a Nazareth album." And yeah, those, was, I covered that song. Those of you listening right now to this podcast or watching it on YouTube or Facebook, uh, let's be honest. Be honest with yourself, and I want to see you in the comments. Did you know that it was a? Uh, did you know that it was a Nazareth song? Though, be honest with yourself. All right. It's only your yeah, did anybody know that not taking it is originally done by Nazareth on the Loud and Proud album, which is one of my favorite albums, except the Ballad of Hollis Brown, the last 10 minute song I always skip, but they had This Flight Tonight was on that album and Teenage Nervous Breakdown, the Little Feet cover and uh, uh, Go Down Fighting and a lot of great stuff. And uh, not taking it has a part that I left out completely. It's funny, the intro is really, really different. And Dan McCafferty, I must say, he's got a, his last album. Uh, this one uh, it's called Last Testament. You should check this out because it's it's and very heavy. Shout out right there. There you go. Yeah. Check out Last He's Testament. The guy. He's the voice that influenced Axl Rose. Influenced a lot of people. But really, this flight tonight. I mean, love hurts. Everybody knows, but. Yeah. This album uh, is it's pretty sad because he's not doing that well these days. You know, he's got a lung disease that makes him really. Uh, he, he it's really hard for him to perform anymore. It's really sad. So well, he's made I, this album and I recommend it. It's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nice one. It's a good one and uh, could be his last. Nazareth is definitely has one of the top uh, 
top four cowbell songs ever made, I think, you uh, know? Yeah, Hair of the Dog. Hair of the Dog. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you got number one, which is obviously Don't Fear the Reaper cowbell song, right? But then you yeah, have yeah, yeah. American Band is a really good cowbell song. Um, uh -huh. I mean, Michael Monroe. Uh, Mississippi is, Queen. Mississippi Queen. That's true. Or, or Stuck in the Middle yeah. with You, Steeler's Wheels. Oh, yeah, that too, yeah. <laughs> you, got, you got the cowbell. <laughs> that sounds like the uh, choir boys. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what is it? Hello, uh, hello. I'm Cardi. <laughs> shout out to the choir boys. Everyone's getting shout outs. McCafferty, yeah. well, choir well, boys. Let's get, let, let's not uh, drift off too far from the subject. In New York City. Yeah, but yeah, so that's how I met Axel. And then I asked him, we were shooting a video and uh, he liked the song. So I said, you want to come and, uh, you know, have a couple of takes. And uh, he says, well, what are the lyrics? I said, don't worry about it. Just, you know, sing along. And uh, he came uh, at the end of the end of the uh, video. He does it. He shows up, and then then he takes off, and it was cool. It was great for me. The I didn't even realize how big they were. Nor did I. I, I just you know my manager said, "Hey, get him in the video." I was like, "Yeah, you stay, stay out of this, please." You know, let me just get to know the guy. And uh, he was a really nice guy. So I thought it worked out great. And he was it was very kind of him to let us use it. It you know got more attention to me, and also if if I may be so bold, got him. Uh, and maybe through me, you got right. more street credibility, which I always you had. You only know. gave street cred to that. Are you kidding me? You are the street cred. You know, you're, <laughs> Thank you're, you. You're, you're more than street cred, you're stage cred. All right. I'll give, I'll give, <laughs> you, you, you give people stage cred. Um, <laughs> but that was a great, yeah, that collaboration continued. Where I went to play them, you know, I went to jam with them a couple of times. First time I met Alice Cooper was at the Riff. Uh, I mean, a rip, rip magazine party in L.A. where I went to play the harp with the, uh, on uh, Heartbreak Hotel with the Guns N' Roses because they were playing there live. And that's when I met uh, Alice Cooper for the first time at, yeah. at that po a party. It was it was amazing. I was I knew Alice was there and I was looking for him. And then someone pulls my sleeve. Says, hey, Mike, Mike. Over here. I was like, oh, Alice. Wow. And it was like he was so sweet. I couldn't believe it. He said, Thank you for speaking so highly of me in the press. I was like, "Hey, man, what the hell?" I mean, it's like he's my yeah, hero. Like, you're truly a fan. You're you're obviously a performer. You're you're a recording artist, but you're you also, when it comes down to it, you're a big fan of a lot of these, uh, a lot of bands and a lot of uh, these iconic artists. You and Alice, uh, we met. Yeah. We met kind of like after you know the after years of going uh when you did your solo album we met years later with on, on the road with alice when you came up and jammed with us uh yeah and and we did some shows with your solo band as well and i remember there was a time we did a, a we did you came up for sound check i mean and we were just we were just doing uh under my wheels and and then <laughs> you came up and say and you said you told me yesterday during sound check that you had a clip of it and and you said and i go no one's ever seen it. This would be great to put on and put on the podcast. So do yeah. you if, we, if Rick Vick rolls the clip of you and I, or you coming I up? I don't mind at all. No, that's great. I yeah, you got the clip, right? There you go. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Right, we're going to have to release the whole clip as some bonus material a little bit later. But yeah, as you can see, was... you're, you're all dressed up, ready to go on stage, and I'm in the sweatpants and a sweat jacket. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I heard you say, you were saying, you said something, Michael, you know this one. I was all the way back at the uh, watching your sound check, and you said, Michael, you know this one. I was like, zhoop. Okay, so, let's do it. <laughs> I would usually sing that song for Soundcheck because Alice is he's doing interviews and all that kind of stuff. You know what? Of course. Alice Cooper is icon iconic. He he don't like like Mariah Carey doesn't do stairs. Alice Cooper don't do sound checks. You know right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, I, I can understand it completely. I, I would sing it or Tommy will sing a song to, to sound check usually and under my wheels was, was mine to take. And uh, then I, I see you and I go, you know, all the words get up here. And then you did. And then like, someone was able to film I was, that. There, I was there in a split second. I think it was my uh, guitar roadie, Bobby, that filmed that. That's nice, man. Yeah. Well, we have, so, the, yeah, go ahead. 
Speaking of the current band, because that's when we were on tour together and we did some stuff. I know that the the, the current band for a uh, one man band, because it's not a one man band. This is obviously a one man gang. You mean one man, one gang. man gang? Sorry, one man gang. Here we go. Definitely. The there's the album right there. How about yeah. that? Yeah, you that's have, the newest album. You. This is how deep the how deep it runs in rock and roll and how relationships and playing with people uh, is more than just playing music it's 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 playing with family you've had that's Sam right Yoffa. you and sammy alpha have been playing together for how many years eons this now eons since we started hanoi rocks i mean since 1979 1980 but yeah. uh we when sammy moved to, moved to new york he was uh he was in many projects with the De demolition 23 album that came out in 93 or 94 and uh all the projects we usually did together were very successful sammy's my blood brother and me and sammy and nasty had that bond that was created when we were on the streets of stockholm and that's never changed you know we're blood brothers uh sammy and me started this band we in 2010 and 2011 uh this album came out which one sensory overdrive was the first one with this new this, this current band 10 years ago this one the this was voted the album of the year by classic rock magazine and it was amazing because at the uh, the award ceremony, Duff McKagan changed his. Uh, he was going to fly to South America, but changed his flight to be able to present the award to me. It was so, and his his speech was so touching. It was amazing. It was talking about the time when Razzle died, and Slash and him had tickets for a ticket for the Hanoi show that was going to happen that didn't happen because Razzle died and all that. So that album. Then we did uh, the Horns and Halos. The, what the other one? It's a mirror image. Uh, this one. This one came out in two thousand thirteen. Horns and Halos, not which one man promo code, not a one man, yeah, and then one man, one man promo. Blackout <laughs> Stage was in 2015, and then there was this yeah. compilation. And this, I gotta say, the there's two CDs. The first one is, uh, you know, stuff from my solo career, beginning, beginning of my solo career, and the second one has three songs per each of these new albums, uh, before One Man Gang, obviously. And then at the end of it, we have the last song of this thing is Magic Carpet Ride with Slash. Uh, featuring Slash, which was never previously released. See, Slash asked me to come with him to uh, uh, do this uh, uh, Steppenwolf uh, cover of yeah. Magic Magic Carpet Ride for the Coneheads movie soundtrack, the comedy movie, you know, Coneheads. Yeah. And he asked me to sing on that. And I got Sammy Alpha to play bass, and Slash had uh, Kenny Aronoff on drums, and that was a killer band. And we did, we did, uh, we were going to cover that song, but then we did a. Um, uh, me and little Steven have been sitting around and uh, working on a you know a new arrangement for the song. So we we kind of kind of turned the chords around and uh, made it more you know because the original is. I love to dream. So we had like. I like to dream. We had a different kind of approach. Uh, so the new different arrangement. Oh, I suggest. Yeah. I suggested that to Slash. And he said, "Well, that sounds cool. Let's do both versions and see which one the uh, record company chooses." Uh, Warner Brothers, the film company, and they they decided to go with the new arrangement version. So the old version was never used. I had it on an audio cassette all these years. That this happened in 1993, so I had all these years I had kept it to myself and uh, never let anybody else have it, of course. And uh, I, you know, maybe played a couple of close friends. But uh, so when this compilation album, you know, which is like my 30 year 30 years career, uh, was coming out, then I I emailed Slash and said. Uh, is there going to be a lot of trouble, you know, negotiating lawyers, guns of money to get this rights to use that that version you know, that I had? And uh, he said, well, send it over. Said, yeah, it was in the email. I just sent it already. He's like, yeah. He, he replied, he's, he's such a sweetheart. He said, it's okay. You could use it. Nice. What? Nice. I love you. I love you. <laughs> I was like, yes. You know so what? it's so like, perfect because we're such. You, you, you're, you're chaotic in your, like, you're chaotic in your everything's chaotic but it's controlled and you know what you're doing and you're very organized and you're punctual i think the one thing that people don't realize in order to make it like as many years as you have you have to be in control of things you have to be you have to have sort of a system of the way you do things so it might seem chaotic but it's definitely controlled and you definitely have a way of doing things and you're very likable no doubt about oh, thank it thank you Thank you. It's nice to hear. There's a method to my madness, in other words, right? Always. always. Well, I wanted to get to the band because we got Sammy, Sammy off of the current lineup because I know yeah. that 
Rich Jones is on guitar. Steve Conte is, yeah. you know, we know Steve as well. A good friend of the show. Carl Rockfist is on the show. So how, how does this line up? It's, it's been a pretty solid lineup for, um, for a few years now, right? Well, 10 years, 10 years. It's been like since 2010. Only difference, difference was, uh, we had Ginger Wildheart on guitar on the sensory overdrive album. Then he was replaced by Dre, uh, uh, for the Horns and Halos album, and then for the Blackout States in 2015, uh, when Dragon couldn't, uh, he had too much on his plate, he had to move on. Rich Jones, who was already a friend and who had already been doing our artwork, you know, he's done all the you know the designs for our artwork and merchandise. The Blackout Rich States, yeah, yeah, there okay. you go. This is the album where Rich Jones came in, and he's still in the band. And this is the best lineup for by far, uh, for the chemistry and everything. And I mean, with all. Uh, it was great with Dragon and with uh, Ginger as well, but this is the best, definitely the best lineup. And the new album was also the second album in a row with the exact same lineup. Yes, One Man Gang, thank you. So this is the newest album which came out last uh, October. And uh, with Rich Jones on the other guitar, rest of the guys have been the same since 2010. Yeah. So uh, this Maybe band, I, I, I like to have great people around me. you got to live with these guys. For for uh, you know on the tour bus you gotta you can't have anybody negative you know if you have this it only takes one guy to ruin the whole vibe and I won't allow that I don't care how good a player you are you gotta be a cool guy you want you want a positive atmosphere and uh, that's back, the only way you can survive. Yeah, goes, that's what you were saying about the PMA positive mental attitude I I, I, yeah. I wrote that down when I saw it and I'm like those are gonna be my three letters I always say enjoy the ride it's kind of always it's a little bit similar. Enjoy the ride. You got to enjoy it because there's, you're going to always have, you know, bumps in the road. You're going to have hurdles that you got to jump over, but you know what, if you have a PMA, you're set. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Make the most of your, make, make the most of your misery. It may not last forever. <laughs> I say that to all the Finnish people go like, wow, oh, man, it's all suck. You know, the worst bonding, uh, the worst kind of bonding is when someone's slagging somebody off and don't you think it sucks? Yeah, I think so too. I hate that. I just can't stand it's what people do. negative energy on top of stuff. I mean, yeah, it makes you feel like shit, too. I mean, if you, if, if, when you're talking not, talking highly of somebody, it makes you feel, it makes you feel better, too. I love the the guy who did the um, Not Faking It album with me, Michael Frondelli, who's the engineer for, uh, actually, he was the engineer for Billy Idol's Rebel Yell as well. Uh, he was like pro producing, uh, he was producing, and he did the Hell Hell Rock and Roll, that Chuck Berry, Keith Richards collaboration, He that record also. So he was the engineer uh, pr producing, um, uh, not faking it with me. And he always says when somebody slagged somebody off in the studio, he says, well, he speaks very highly of you. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> everyone always like, well, makes me feel like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It really made you feel like shit. <laughs> oh, and I just flagged him off. Well, he speaks very highly of you. In other words, uh, you know, don't flatter yourself. Do you think he even, even you know, spends any? Yeah. Just one second to think of you. How do you? What do you think you think about you? And say, oh, well, he speaks very highly of you. I think it was great when he always said that. I was like, everyone's, oh, yeah? <laughs> Does he mean that or not? Yeah, uh, yeah, right. Did he actually say that? <laughs> well, when, you say, when you say Billy Idol, that kind of opens the door for me to go into. Oh. And by the way, just so you know, just so you know I'm going to be blowing up your email to play on a track with you because just doing one sound check of, of uh, Under My Wheels is not good enough for me that you have on your iPhone. I wanted, I want to play on a track with you. I feel it's it's been much too long, so I'm saying it right here on the record in the trenches that uh, I definitely going to be uh, I'm going to be anytime and getting on a rec uh, getting on a yes. record pretty soon. You you have Let's such do it. You've played with such amazing guitar boys. I guess like you said, uh, Dragon is is sort of Sweden's rock and roll institution, and yeah, you, it's like Slash in America. Exactly. Dragon like the Sweden Sweden Slash. Uh, but then you yeah. got. One I wanted to talk about because you opened the door with Billy Idol um, is that you. I knew yeah, you were going to do. It. <laughs> you knew I was going to go there, huh? I don't. If, uh, hopefully, you want to talk. Hopefully, this is not a no-go zone. But I did want to talk about the band that you had uh, with Jerusalem uh, with Steve Stevens called Jerusalem Slim. Uh, what happened was that, and is that you know, is that something that was a cool time or was it a transition? <laughs> it's it's just a just a project that. Uh, Kind of ruined my career in America, you know. Well, thanks a much. lot, Dave R, for bringing that up. All right, I'm not. I'm, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, you know, it's just a, it's not a positive experience. In the end of the day, I mean, uh, I don't want to waste too much time on this, but uh, you know, it's uh, there was a, there was a conflict as it turned out. I mean, the guy wanted to work with me, 
Yeah. And he kind of looked the part and uh, he heard the Not Faking It album. And the thing is, one of the things was like the solo in the song called All, All Night With The Lights On. It had oh. that solo and that, that effect, that, that kind of effect in the middle of the solo that Michael Frandelli did for uh, Phil Grandy. Phil Grandy played the guitar in the Not Faking album. God rest his soul. He just passed away a couple of years ago. Amazing player. He had like nothing between him and the guitar. I've rarely, rarely witnessed such direct contact with his emotion and going into the guitar. And he, he's the guy who first said, rock like fuck. <laughs> One morning he came to the studio and said, all right, let's rock like fuck. And I said, that's my slogan. I like your PMA better, but but rock like fuck. Oh, is I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Can I say the F word here? I'm, I didn't mean to. Do whatever you want, man. You, you're fine. Okay, okay. Well, you know, yeah. This is not the PG-13. Ah! <laughs> Great. All right, so. The guy wanted to work with me, and we started working on some songs, and I showed him what kind of guitar playing I liked, and he's a really good player, so he could play their Chuck Berry stuff, too. And uh, But then and I wanted Little Steven to produce the album, but the record company wouldn't go for that, and they wanted to have a uh, German Michael Wagner, who was a heavy metal producer, who was like a bad combination with Steve, because Steve didn't need much encouragement to go that way with the two hands on the neck and the doodly do, you know, with a million notes a second and no soul. And uh, as it turned out, it was a money thing. A lot of the, I mean, uh, the publishing thing was funny too, because he said all of a sudden that he needs to have 50% of all the publishing for all, every song. And I was like, how do you know who's going to write how much of the song? And my, my company Polygram already took 50% of the publishing. And I was well, like, here's so, the deal. So I feel, I feel like that project looks great on paper. I'm sorry. Yeah. Didn't work out. I know that it died a of loneliness. <laughs> one of those albums that people are talking about still today. So it's one of those, I guess, uncut gems or one of those diamonds in the rough that when people yeah. find, it, they're really, they're they're really happy they did. I and mean, trust me, I it was a couple. It of could those. have been a good record. We did make some good demos, but then the studio and we ended up going to L.A., which was like I didn't want to record in L.A. Uh, we did the vocals like in Wisconsin in some weird studio in, uh, uh, you know, uh, and it was like not really happening. And then the, everything was getting all uh, into, we went to LA to do a couple of weeks of guitars and it turned into three months of guitar hell. <laughs> and uh, the whole whole project was like, I was on uh, Polygram Records. It was my deal, Michael Mon as Michael Monroe. And after the Not Faking It album, you know, as I was making that record, I needed some uh, more money in the budget. So there's, okay, sign a publishing deal. Okay, uh, so I need a little bit more, a couple of grand more. Okay, sign a merchandise deal. So they got me by the balls. So maybe and those, those are, the, those are I, two things not to do when you're strapped. Now, cash. Go okay, to the so record. What account. happened? Well, you wanted to go here. So I'll, I'll tell this. I'll try to keep right. it short. I don't want to waste time on this. Uh, so as it turned out, Michael, we had people that, that the internet started getting all fuzzy and and weird and negative the minute we started talking about negative stuff so no, yeah, not, i told you i told you let's not go there but I, okay the conflict as it turned out there were the album ended up costing over seven hundred thousand dollars and uh, i was in la going crazy my a and r guy was in in new york nobody was helping me the guy in uh, the a and r guy in uh, la came to the studio Steven uh, Wagner played him some stuff. Said, hey, it sounds good. What's your problem, Michael? I said, what? You want to spend another $300,000 and then realize it's a piece of shit? It's not my record anymore. And it was my deal with Polygram. So I, I already owed them for not faking it like a couple of, a couple of hundred thousand. Right. And then this was like almost. So after this album, and I thought, you know, I was freaking out. I thought this record is going right to hell. And uh, uh, Sammy at least came up with a name. I even suggested suggested the, to the label to call it Faking It, but they wouldn't go for it because <laughs> they wanted to release the album. The worst thing that ever happened, that album came out. And uh, uh, I ended up on the comp record company a million. I, I was, you know, a million in a hole. I would have had to sell. I mean, I would never see a penny. So after yeah. that whole project, what I thought maybe Steve I knew something, I didn't know. But then when it came to mixing, Steve came up to me and says, hey, Michael, uh, Wagner's went mixing it all wrong. I said, wait a minute. Ah, but no, 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 no. You guys, I thought you guys had some kind of, you know, connection or something. Now you're saying he's doing it wrong. This was recorded all wrong. This is totally not what the demos were uh, that you totally turned around and maybe you think your, your solos are not going to save any song. And uh, the problem, the conflict in the whole thing was based on was I play from the heart. Steve Stevens plays from the wallet. Oh, That's wow. true. Uh, that's, well, that's, that's, that's the fact. You know, it was all more business than music. And after that, now, 
after that, More? I had no choice than get off the label. My whole deal with Polygram, I had like 10 year dollars, seven, eight, nine albums, whatever. I had to get off the label and it took me over a year to get off the label. And one day my lawyer called me, said, Michael, you're dropped. I said, oh, that's too bad. And I called a little Steven. I said, Steven, I'm free. And so little Steven said, isn't it great, Michael? One day you owe them a million, the next day you don't. So then after that, we went into the studio with little Steven producing me and Sammy Alpha, and we started the band Demolition 23, which is supposed to be my solo album, but it turned out we came up with a name. And, uh, you know, luckily the Jerusalem Slim album, had, Sammy came up with that name. Sammy Alpha came up with Jerusalem Slim, which is slang for Jesus, right? He, uh, he came up with the name, luckily, because uh, if it was under Michael Monroe, I would be dead. You know, my career, unless it was called Faking It. Truthfully, and I even did an anti-promotional tour in Japan, saying, "Don't buy this record." I, I, in 1992, me, Nasty Suicide, and Sammy Alpha, and Tommy Price on drums, and Phil Grandy on guitar, did a great tour in Japan where we played all the songs except nothing from the Jerusalem Slim, Jerusalem Slim album, except for Teenage Nervous Breakdown, the cover which I covered, you know, the, which Nazareth and the Little Feet song that Nazareth had covered. That was the only song we played live. Rest of them, I said, "Don't buy the album; it sucks." <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, Michael, after this podcast, Jerusalem Slim is going to have this newfound success. And then, <laughs> well, it, it was like heavy metal histrionics, all this. Damn it. Oh, man, you know, you want to, you know, you want to go there. Well, that's the story. And, and, you know, Steve was a really nice guy. I got along with him great. He looked the part. It was cool. And uh, we had some fun times together. But uh, the record was the worst thing that ever happened to me. That's why I don't, you know, I hate it that it came out that was even released. Damn. All right. I want to move on then to a guitar <laughs> story. Maybe hey, well, yeah. with, with, <laughs> you gotta love it. I mean, you know, after I'm that, my yeah. I not, <laughs> some people like that record, you know. <laughs> I did not expect that answer when I asked that question because I was like, oh, I like that album. I like both guys, they're amazing guys, and then and then I just didn't expect it. I it's not like I was doing it. And, you know, on purpose, just to like stir the pot. Trust me, I I, I can do that yeah. on any other shows. I can do that on my buddy's coffee talk show. But uh, hey, check out. <laughs> check out one more thing. <laughs> what happened was, Steve, <laughs> when the what? thing was when I was held, left carrying the bag of shit. Uh, then when I said to Steve, "You want to say this record?" Then we got to start all over. He says, "Okay, uh huh, okay." So we go back back to New York and start all over. And we even remixed the song with this guy, Bob Rosa, which was kind of getting better. So then all of a sudden, Steve disappeared. And then he ended up, he, he was nowhere to be found for a while. Then I was watching TV and MTV, some award ceremony. He had ended up, he was, um, uh, Motley Cruz, Vince Neil was doing a comeback. And he was playing guitar with him. And they made an album together. And on that album, there was a song, uh, <clears throat> there was a song called... Uh, uh, there was a song we had, it was called Down Molly Mobile, and the chorus went, Can't have your cake and eat it too. So there was a song called Can't Have Your Cake, which was credited to Steve Stevens and Vince Neil, which I had written with Steve originally. So he stole that song from me, even. Oh God, okay. So, so then, well, then I said to Polygram, You got my publishing, I'm paying you 50%, do something. <laughs> so they did nothing. So, right. uh, you know, uh, but I'm I heard, uh, a completely separate part two is going to be uh, dedicated to Jerusalem Slim and signing <laughs> bad publishing deals and all, well, that, yeah. all that bad Yeah, but stuff. I mean, that was, that was a typical of record company, you know. No they doubt. got you by the boss. So you, they take all your money, then they do nothing for you. They're supposed to get your songs and movies. So you're given the publishing. I and mean, the publishing in advance is really your own money that they give you as a loan. Then you have to earn it back. So it's not really like extra money. So that's what happened, uh, you know. You've but anyways, that's own. enough of that. You've created your own brand now. You've created your own institution, right? You know, and you've actually created your own genre. And and a lot of people that, that are inspired by that genre. Um, one of the people that obviously you said earlier that you looked up to noticed you and uh, asked you to perform uh, with their band at Les Paul's 75th birthday at the hard rock cafe in new york so that oh. was that was a story that i want people to know about because it's a nice guitar player story i think michael's gonna end up liking this guitar player because the guitar player was none other than les paul his 75th birthday and who was the band that asked asked you aerosmith to aerosmith yeah i jammed with aerosmith on les paul's 75th birthday at the hard rock cafe in new york city uh as it turned out night bob uh, who was my sound guy uh, in the early 90s. Yeah, I love Night Bob. He does. He Night ran Bob, he's holy. 
<laughs> he's, oh, he's Night Bob is a killer. He's, guy. He's, book. A, he's all over the book that Walk This Way book, but he he used to run uh, the sound at uh, Don Hills when I yeah. used to play there when I come in. And Night Bob is just a, a legend. And yeah, yeah he's, he's right there on Van Damme Street. Yeah, yeah, he's flat there, and uh, he's a he's a, he's a brilliant guy. I hate the Dolls. He was doing the Dolls, the New York New New York Dolls, and. So Night Bob ran into Steven Tyler at some MTV Unplugged thing, and Steven asked what, what Bob had been doing, and Bob said, you know, just Michael Monroe in Japan. I said, oh, I love that guy. Give, him his, give me his phone number. So, uh, so Bob um, gave him my phone number, and then one day I came home, and there was a message on my answering machine saying, Michael Monroe, Steven Tyler, just wanted to pass on some stuff. I was like, <laughs> what? Steven Tyler calling me? Then Bob called me and says, hey, Michael, I, uh, I uh, you know, ran into Steven. I hope you don't mind. I gave him your number. I said, no, I don't mind. <laughs> I can see the sunlight coming out of the window here. It's shining. No, it, I know. It sounds like Jerusalem Slim or... You know. <laughs> yeah, the second <laughs> coming. Right uh, turn this on. Hang on. Okay. It's better. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, that was the event. They gave him a cake that was made... This is Sunburst Less Fall cake, right? Right. That was right. amazing. Yeah. So I uh, mm -hmm. I have... Uh, he had, Stephen called me again. I, I, was, I said to Bob, I wonder what he wanted. And uh, Stephen called me back and he says, Hey, man... He loved my album, not faking it. He said he loves my singing because I sing in pitch. And uh, he said, uh, "You want to?" Then he said, "You want to come and play the saxophone on?" Uh, they're doing his thing for Les Paul, like a half hour set. And uh, do I want to come and play a sax solo on Big Ten Inch Record, that old R and B song? Big Ten R and B meaning meaning R and B. What R and B was that? Yeah, big. She just loved my Big Ten Inch Record of my favorite blues. So I was like, of course, you know. So I went there, and uh, <clears throat> it was. Uh, amazing it was a long line outside i said how am i going to get in here and then before i could think another thought there was a guy in a suit that came and says mr monroe right this way please <laughs> took me to my table and uh, i was like wow that was such a great organization around and, and steven and you know i was there was a lot of people there mtv was i had this on video but i i wouldn't i would not uh, send it I, I gave it to actually last uh, uh two two years ago when we opened up for the hollywood vampires i ran into joe perry Right. Uh, backstage, and I, I had made, uh, I, I have a machine that makes VHS into you can transfer into DVD. So I made him a DVD of the of that video of that song. I had that song only, and that, uh, that was that almost to the day. Wow. Sorry, it was the from same. It was like June twelfth, and this happened. Uh, I think it was the June tenth that we're doing that gig. That was like almost to the day. Uh, how many years? Nineteen ninety one to right. two thousand fifteen. It was like almost the same date that that had happened. So I gave him the DVD. I don't know if he has a DVD player in him, but I remember the event. I went to my lawyer, Michael Guido. Do you know Michael Guido from New York? I remember Michael Guido, of course. Yeah, I he was always hanging with Richard Sambora. They, they were hanging out there, you know, having drinks. And Michael, I, you know, I used to drink a little. I never really liked drinking, but uh, Michael said, come on, Mike, have a drink. I said, no, 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 i got to go and play my sax solo. He says, come on. Okay, well, order me a tequila sunrise. And my late wife Judy was at the, at the table, and so was Stephen's wife uh, uh, and and uh, and Joe Perry's wife. They were sitting at the table, and uh, I was like, "No, Michael, I don't really want to drink." But okay, order me a tequila sunrise. Apparently, uh, well, then the song came up. I had to go and play, and <laughs> apparently they had brought a tequila sunrise, this huge tequila sunrise, and uh, fucking six tequila shots and tequila you know, beer chasers, and so Stevens and uh, Joe Perry's wife, like, all these drinks from Michael. And with Judy, my late wife, said, no, 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 no. And I was I was pissed later because I realized that they didn't, you know, the Aerosmith guy later on, they didn't want to sit at my table because there was all these drinks there and they didn't drink oh, anymore. Yeah, then, yeah, and I didn't like drinking myself. But I went on stage and Steven Tyler said, where'd you get those lips? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story, right? <laughs> he, yeah, it was great. And then, and then it's, can you really play that I, thing? I, and I, I played a couple of riffs and then did my solo the best I could. And... Uh, even Joe Perry smiled. He was like, "Yeah, that was good. That was good." Just, and just to wrap that one up, though, Michael, like going yeah. back, to, going back to that Les Paul shaped uh, cake that they had for Les Paul. Um, that night, did you have your cake and eat it too? All right, that's it. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> well, I think uh, "Down Down Mobile" was a much cooler, cooler uh, uh, title for that song. If you want to go back to that, <laughs> I do not. I, I actually had a better melody than what they did later on. I think personally, I'm going to you. I'm moving on. I'm moving on to uh, one man. Yeah, that was one. The yeah, new that was one of the great nights. One of the greatest nights of my life. I gotta say. See, then I'm glad I brought it up. All right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That was a great experience. I'm still proud of it. I'm glad, and I wish. I was in touch with those guys more because they're yeah. a great band. And Steven Tyler actually did inspire me 
I remember on the phone, I was talking to the pump album was out and Jamie's got a gun. Amazing song. And uh, I remember talking to him on the phone and I said, you know, I like that new song. Jamie is a gun. Is it, uh, Jamie's got a gun. Oh, yeah, right. I knew it was Jamie's got a gun, but I was trying to be cool. Like I didn't know the song. Just like I name. knew one man gang, <laughs> not one man band. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, who cares? You know, whatever. But anyway, Stephen was great. Also, this is funny. Night Bob doesn't have a sense of smell, right? You know that? He doesn't well, smell I, anything. I think I know why. So first, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know why, but uh, well, I guess like, it happened. <laughs> Come yeah, on. of course you think the obvious, but I don't know. Was it born like that, or was it mm. from whatever? But he, uh, the first thing that Stephen, listen, Stephen, Stephen came up to Bob. He says, he stuck his hand down his pants and between his legs, and he put his no finger in front of Bob's nose. He says, "Do you smell anything, Bob?" <laughs> but maybe, uh, maybe he's just fresh. Maybe he's just very cleanly. Maybe he was born that way. However, Stephen is a funny, very funny, lovely guy. I love that guy. How talented! How much he sings his pitch. This day, even today. When you see them live, amazing singer, incredible. I can't yeah. believe. I'm trying to make I, this sunshine go away. <laughs> for, those, yeah, so, uh, for those of you that are just listening in, if you're listening on uh, on Spotify or listening on Apple Podcasts, you can't see the chaos that's going on that we're managing. It, Michael is managing. He's battling with the sunlight. With, with the, <laughs> yeah. you know, like My the eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Come on. <laughs> fact, you know, because we are streaming this right now, it is yeah. basically 7 o'clock uh, p.m. in uh, Stockholm, which would make 8. No, it's past. It's it, you're, you're an hour past. Oh, man. yeah. It's, it's 8 past 8 in, in Finland now, in we've p.m. Been, we're, we've been rolling for so long with... Uh, We've been rolling for a while now, and obviously, I, I don't want to end, but we have to at one point uh, at least wrap it up, at least wrap up part one. But I, I do want to sort of slow things down just a little bit. I told uh, you it's going to be a part two. There's got to be a part two. <laughs> I, 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 like I'm saying, I'm saying all these cool stories are too cool for one podcast. We got to make them twice. But you know what? I want to concentrate on the new album, One Man Gang. I want yeah. the people to see the the uh, the clip that Vic we put up you sent over you're gracious enough to send over last night uh, this one's called Last Train to Tokyo because I want to talk about the whole relationship that you have with Japan and how basically it's your secondary kingdom you have you know the world but then Japan is a very special place for you so let's listen yeah. to the clip Last Train to Tokyo and then talk about that yeah, you know, I'm on the last train back to Tokyo I want I want to do I want to go back to playing live shows. When I see stuff like that, Michael, don't you want to play a live show, damn it? Yeah, I do. I was like, <laughs> that's my favorite kind of exercise. It's like, you know, you gotta go for uh, that, you know, that's when I, you know, stay in shape and all. And uh the the feeling after a great show, it's like the best, best feeling in the world. That's what you know, the kick after you've done a great show, you're you're on a high, right? Absolutely. That's like the best feeling in the world. But it's you, amazing. You know, you're doing an interview, so you know what I can. I, and if you turn around, uh, I, I I would normally think I was interviewing someone in a dressing room right now, but you have a, a little makeup stand right there, a makeup. Stand. <laughs> yeah, is, oh, yeah. that is. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I didn't see that. All right. That's yeah, what, and did you see? Oh, you haven't seen my. Have you seen my uh, Firebird? Go Check away. Out my Firebird, man. I got my name and in pearl inlays here, Michael Monroe. Look at that. Look at that. Ain't that a little honey? You know what? If you if you're watching this or listening to it on the podcast, you got to watch it on YouTube or Facebook. Wow, this is killer. That is yeah, a great. Exactly. Who made that for you, man? Was that custom well, built? Custom no, it was. <laughs> I just I bought this from Andy McCoy, used with a full price. The, the motherfucker made me pay for it, and <laughs> and I had you know sunburst, and I had it painted in London. <laughs> I had it painted a, a glossy black and I had the pearl inlays on it. So after that, Andy wanted it back. He said, can I borrow that for, and it, you know, he kept saying that, you know, you should play guitar on one song, but then that guitar was so cool looking that he was like, I can't yeah, bring uh, the guitar to the sound check. And he's like, well, let's do it tomorrow. And then the next day, no, no, let's do it tomorrow. And I was like, now I realized he didn't want me to play the guitar because it looked so good. So one day, can I borrow that guitar from you? I said, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah it's a cool I, I like that one that's a that's, it's a great one to play too and have a less ball too and stuff 
or home studio. But yeah, you want to go back to the new album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to suggest maybe you know you know Steve Con Steve and uh, Rich are going to kill me, but maybe you, uh, Andy McCoy, and Steve Stevens all put a band together. Is that possible? Oh, oh my favorite. Yeah, who can be, who's the <laughs> asshole? Who's the asshole we can find for a drummer? <laughs> or basically <laughs> no. Um, no 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 it's all in good fun i love all of those guys i love you steve i love you Andy. you know that so there you go anyway uh all my love PMA, uh, PMA, baby so let's talk about your relationship that you have with the people of japan because they love you they have for years what's it like when you go down there is it basically a holiday is it? Do they have a national holiday down there? Where does it go? Yeah, no, no, no. It's it's well. You first of all, you're all jet lagged when you get there, and it lasts <laughs> usually over a week or two, about a week. You know, just when you're recovering from the jet lag, you start got to fly back, fly, <laughs> got to leave again. But that song, "Last Train to Tokyo," it's it's really about you know how how hectic the whole thing is and how you're it feels like a space trip because you're all jet lagged and you you're there only for a short amount of time. You're feeling exhausted and overwhelmed by everything, but it's still. It's a great, you're loving the experience because the people there are so positive and so uh, genuine, genuine and, uh, uh, and uh, sincere and uh, passionate about rock and roll. And they're, they're such a great positive vibe that you can't help but love it all. It's, a, it's just my favorite country, uh, of, you know, because they're, and the way they're brought up, they're so considerate and they're nice, kind, never aggressive. Even when they drink, they're like they just giggle and they pass out. They never get aggressive like in Finland or or in England. Someone like at one point, someone's gonna go, oh, "Yeah, fucking cunt." There, <laughs> someone gets aggressive. You know, the Japanese are amazing. I, I just love that that mentality. Yeah. It's just one of my I favorite mean, countries. The thing is, I've I've been lucky enough to go there a couple times. Twice, I think two or three times. Not enough. I would love to go there more. But every when I do go there. They have my record collection, every record I've ever played on, uh, in pristine condition, in all the right packaging. They they have the right pen to sign for the right, uh, you know, that vinyl or CD. It's an amazing yeah. process. But and, but they they also give you gifts. So I'm just wondering how many gifts do you get when you go to Japan on one of those trips? Well, I had first of all their their attention to detail and all the the CDs they make there, like this this CD, like the, oh, there's this uh, wonderful cartoonist Atsuko Shima who draws me like this. Sure. I love her drawings, and we made a T-shirt with the whole band when she's drawn. Uh, this they make uh, they they sell CDs, physical product. That's why I also love them. Uh, but um, so. <laughs> God, I lost my train of thought. Your question was just the the amount of gifts because they do pay the gifts. Yeah. So what happened in uh, after Hanoi Rocks broke up? You know, we were in we Hanoi Rocks played there in '83 and '84. Then we broke up, and after that, and with not faking it, I was like way even bigger than uh, Michael Monroe, as Michael Monroe. I was bigger than Hanoi Rocks ever was, and I was getting bigger and bigger. In '89, I played the New Year's Eve gig was great. We had Japanese band Loudness, Michael Monroe, Don Henley. Brian Adams and Huey Lewis. The, the, Mr. Udo had this at Tokyo Dome, two nights, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, 89, yeah. 1990. And then we did uh, Nagoya and Kyoto and Osaka as well. Uh, and then I had, I came back from my own tour. I had so many gifts. I had to, they said Bon Jovi didn't even get, get that many gifts. So there was something special about, I had like, I had to buy four big metal trunks to put this stuff in and I stayed up, I, I slept maybe two hours at night because I was going through all this amazing stuff they gave me. The wedding kimonos, uh, incredible like fans and beautiful art that I couldn't get rid of, you know? So I had to like, it was driving me crazy. It was so much stuff. I had like a hundred Michael Monroe dolls, you know, <laughs> it's like, it was amazing. So I had more gifts than anybody. And I was like, I had to send them cargo in the, in the trunks to get to New York later on because I saw too much of it. So four so, trunks, four trunks, or you know, four extra luggages to get uh, pieces of luggage to get back. That's basically like one week on the road with Alice Cooper and him shopping at H and M. How about that? Oh, really? <laughs> you like to shop, you like to shop right? H and M or Zara? So, so let's <laughs> a quick question here, Michael Monroe. That man never ages. Huge you in oh. any? If Thank I you, Robert. In a uh, man this is the guy well there you go robert not so much a question but a personal thank you robert there it is love you thank you how kind thank you for your kind words i right. love that you alice, alice is shopping that much 
<laughs> oh, dude, he's a, he's a shopaholic. He, I mean, you know, you know, he used to drink a little bit. He, he's well documented. He used to do a little this, a little that, but now he does. He puts it all into the H and M uh, and uh, Zara and whatever chain clothing stores are around the world. I say the best time to ever meet Alice Cooper is not sort of um, at the show because you know he'll give you a stare that'll like just turn. Oh, yes, Alice. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to mess with Alice. But if you want Alice, yeah. Alice, Alice, just meet him at, a, at an H and M or Zara, whatever town you're in. You know? God bless him, and, and and that's why he's still here for sure. I mean, that's a healthier addiction for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, is that thank God for that? Is that sort of your basic like on the road routine? Because people, there's been a lot of comments I've been checking out where they're saying, "How does this man look so you know look so good after so many years of being in this business in the trenches, always rocking and always rolling it? How what <laughs> is your sort of routine to keeping fit are you going to have a some sort of fitness regime tape out now or what how no, do you do i have no no secrets i just uh i like what i do i think uh you know loving life and uh being uh i never i don't drink i never like drinking i never you know it made me feel bad and uh you know of course i changed my demons back in the day i went through uh, i wanted to more like expand my horizons i, I was talking to god and i uh, had an out-of-body experience and all that and i broke on through to the other side, so to speak, to see what I wanted to see and, uh, you know, to uh, satisfy my curiosity. And I went through all that and, um, you know, I just didn't want to get hooked. You know, when you go, once you get hooked, then you're kind of going around in circles. So I think we're here to, our souls are here to learn and, uh, you know, uh, without getting too deep or phys- ph- philosophical, I don't, you know, I never liked drinking and, I think that's one thing, you know, drinking makes you look old. And uh, once you, if you start worrying about getting old, then you start looking at it. I think by the time you're 50 or 60, you, you'll have the face you deserve. You, <laughs> your personality, personality starts showing. So uh, I live healthily. You know, I don't, I don't go to the gym. You know, I exercise at home. I, I stay in shape. Like I, I have to stay in shape in order to uh, do what I do. Like I said, uh, so there's no real secret. Uh, I'm just, you know, and I'm happy with my wife. I have, you know, my late wife, we were, together for 15 years as so she passed away in 2001 and I didn't think I, I didn't think I was going to find another uh, I wasn't going to be lucky enough to find another uh, uh, life companion but then I found my current wife we've been married for 17 years now and I know I'm an exception to the rock and roll singer rule you know I don't I don't like I said I don't I never been with a group in my life I, it's not my I, I couldn't do that because I don't think that way I, I and I never looked for a relationship you can't look for you never find it if you look for it it happens or it doesn't so uh, I got two cats and my wife and happy at home. I don't mind <laughs> this quarantine doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't kill me because I, I still like spending time at home, but I'm happy. I love doing what I do and I got the best band I could hope for. So I guess it shows. Well, it's because know. you give credit where credit's due. You give the love to the band and you know what, dude, you're not the, you're not the exception to the rule. I think you are the rule. That's the way all all musicians should have that sort of attitude, and yeah. I, I would like to say, yeah, I don't I don't drink, but I enjoy a car- occasional wine, and that's what I'm having a little wine time right now because yeah, when it's time to wind down and wind down the pot. <laughs> nice pun. Hey, wait a minute, he's got schools out ready for a thirty second clip. Vic says he's got schools out. Does he? All right. Well, if yeah. he's got schools out, we'll do yeah. one more. Thing. That was. Oh, it's the greatest, one of the greatest nights of my life. You should see in that video, there's a clip where Alice commands me to come next to him. He goes like this <laughs> with his knife. It's like, oh, okay, that's an order. <laughs> Thank you. Steve, I was so happy Steve that Conte. night. It was one of the greatest nights of my life. Steve Conte's on there with his, his amazing. Oh, yeah, movie. yes. <laughs> Steve was there. And uh-huh. it's funny because yeah. I asked Alice uh, the lyrics. Uh, the first. I was saying, uh, when you say, we can't even think of a word that rhymes. Was that when you, did you run out of ideas or what? When you're running that lyric, uh, that can't even think of a word that rhymes. It's, no, it's also because the first word verse rhymes. We got no choice. All the boy, girls and boys, 
uh, 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 make all that noise because I found new toys. That all rhymes. Second yeah. verse. We ain't got no class. We ain't got no principles. We ain't got no innocence. Yeah. We can't even think of a word that rhymes because that those none of those none lines rhyme. rhyme. I love stuff like that. It's behind you didn't know that. No, I never knew that. Never knew yeah. that. Yeah. There's a couple ah. things I didn't know. I, I okay. Like, I, I love that stuff. That's why you I know love the bon freaking podcast. And, and I gotta say about Johnny Thunders, we talked about Johnny and Sonda Weber and all that. That's <laughs> I'm not gonna tell the story about the Maxis Kansas City bathroom if you don't want to. Please but, do. But okay, <laughs> for those of you that know that don't know, uh Johnny Thunders, lead guitar player in the New York Dolls, but also had his own his own solo career with so many great songs. It was all about the yeah. song, Johnny. Yeah, and Johnny was a dear friend. Yeah. So I was talking to Johnny actually when I was that around the time when I jammed with Aerosmith, I was so excited. I was jazzed, you know, uh, that I was playing uh, the sax and I was, I've been talking to Steven Tyler. So I, uh, Johnny called me, he was living in third street back then. And says like, so what are you, what are you doing, man? He says, yeah. Have you heard the latest Aerosmith? Have you heard the last Aerosmith album? He says, nah, I didn't hear the first one. I was, <laughs> okay. And this, yeah, this, so I got a new album called not faking it. So he says, so what were you doing before? <laughs> <laughs> That's like so New York, so Johnny. Johnny used to go with Sanda. They said, Sanda told me they were fixing in the, they were shooting up in the Max's Kansas City bathroom and there was a poster of New York Dolls on the wall. So, and when Johnny finished fixing, he would squirt the blood on John, Dave Johansson's face. <laughs> anyway. You don't, you don't want to know, know my, no, no, seriously. You want to know my Johnny Thunders sort of? Uh, yeah, tell me, tell me. No, oh, my, my mom, who just God rest her soul, she just passed away just recently. But oh, she she came to New York City. She came to New York City when uh, I lived there, and she went out with me and my buddy Stefan. We took her out all night on the town. I I, I actually took her to um, what's the place, the Chelsea Hotel. I wanted her because because a buddy of ours had you know a room there for that night. And then by the end of the night, I said, mom, do you want to go to bed? We can take you back to, you know, to the apartment. You can sleep on the couch or whatever. It's no problem. Cause you know, it's New York. You can sleep on a couch. And she said, she's a trooper. She said, no, I want to go out with you the whole night. I want to experience the whole night with you. We took her to the, to the loft. So you, you had said that you had not been to the loft, but my mother was at the loft and the, and wow. the loft, just to give you an idea about this place called the loft in New York city, it opened up at 4 AM. It was an after hours. So here's my mom, 50 something year old mom. It's probably my age right now. Right. But she's a trooper. She goes into the loft but everybody there was so nice to like sort of surround her and 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 sort of almost guard her from Johnny oh. Thunders because Johnny Thunders was in the, it was literally in the next room shooting up and and like when <laughs> we were gonna be, we ended up playing uh, Stepping Stone that night right oh really <laughs> yeah so so my mom got to see me in Johnny Thunders jam so that's a kind of a fun story about that but yeah. and, and Johnny Thunders never played the court well. Put it this way: He played the chords he played. He didn't. Yeah. He played, it, he played E G A B, where it's actually E G A C. So, but when I tried to correct him on it, he goes, "Play it my way." <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I, I think, and it's, yeah. And and it, it was especially it's not what you play; it's what you don't play. It's all the space, and you know what you. All this. Uh, well, Steve Stevens actually told me that he went to he wanted to jam with Johnny at the limelight, and then Johnny finally I told him, "Okay, come on up," and he went up to play with him and. Johnny went in front of him, combing his hair like that, <laughs> and then then he said, "Are you from Poison?" <laughs> and Steve left the stage. Apparently, that's what I he told know, me. He would have anyway, me. I'm not I sure. mean, I know you love the guys playing, and he's a great player. That's the subject keeps going back to that. But I gotta say, if you want to talk a bit more about my new album, there's a song called "The Pitfalls of Being an Outsider," which has the the lyrics are a bit of a piss take about the hip hop scene because it said you know we don't got no we don't get no champagne on the rider uh these are the pitfalls of being an outsider but it was uh, you know the theme of the song is that we do this whether we get all the, the money and cars and the champagne we do this whether we get those things or not and we do this on for the right reasons because you're not on stage because you want the approval i ain't coming out because i need the love don't want to join your social club it ain't a long way to the bottom. It's always a, that's a nod to Bon Scott as well. It's a long way to the top, kind of yeah. you know, in homage yeah, to him. But uh, it's you can lose it all at any time, and that's why you better do it for the right reasons. I ain't coming out uh, to support the scene. I don't give a fuck if you don't like me. It ain't a long way to the bottom. That so that's you better. That's what the song is saying is that better do this for the right reasons. 
because uh, it all may fall apart at any time. So it's a bit of advice to the younger bands but and artists too. You know, you play from the heart and thing? stick true to yourself. Stay true to yourself. No one can take away from you what you have. You know, but if you do it for the money and the fame, that's the wrong reasons. <laughs> I want to know the, the, when's it when's it going to be in a video. I want to know when the, that video is coming out. Well, that song is actually one of the most popular songs of the album now, apparently. Is is, so, okay. uh, is is it already out there right now? Does Vic have a clip of that it's one? On this, uh, no, it's there's no video for it. It's on okay. the album. Buy the record. <laughs> one man gang. <laughs> Buy the record tonight. But you know what, Mike? Then it's up to you to make the video tomorrow, and then we'll debut it on the Sunday live stream Sunday. Can you make one yeah. of those videos of that with the guys? Because I, honestly, I I don't mean to like pressure you on it, but you know, no. There, there was a song we did that with 150. There was a. <laughs> sorry, what did you say? I want you to make one of those, you know, those videos that they that everybody's making these days. Yeah, there's virtual. Yeah, I was part of one in Finland. They had a song called uh, uh, "In Front of Something New." It was uh, 150 artists. I played the sax solo on it that uh, came out a while ago, and you know how all these, you know, all these people. The thing is, uh, sending, making a video and sending it via WeTransfer, I can do that, but it takes forever. Last night I was sending that Alice clip for you three times, and it didn't go through. I was like, almost 90 percent. It says okay. 22 minutes left then it says 30 minutes left oh okay so i'm waiting <laughs> and it doesn't go through i was like it was like must have been two in the morning when it finally went through so so uh, i'm not good at that stuff so uh, i would love to make a video if it was easier <laughs> i know you say you're not user friendly but you're definitely friendly enough it be and the in the internet gods like you enough that our wi-fi connection has been quite stellar through this whole entire show it really has so uh it has, yeah. You must have been done doing something right. And even though yeah. you're very animated when you move and that kind of messes up sometimes with the Wi-Fi, you did great. Everything worked out perfectly. There Thank was a you. I'm glad to have you on. I hope to have you on again. I hope to get uh, – I'm going to sort of – sort of like i said get you and uh, rich and steve and sammy and carl to maybe do one of those videos for that song that you just gave us the lyrics to yeah so and and, and pitfalls out, have been an outsider and yeah. somebody asked about Andy mccoy no it's unlikely that we're going to work together again for uh oh, okay. so to ask just to answer i forgot i, I missed the name but uh well, yeah one, anyway but uh yeah that song uh, the new album i mean has i have no need to work with anyone other than this band because and, and with you of course you want to do anything with oh, you roxy yeah. I'm, I'm and emailing Mr. Right. Roxy anytime okay. for you, Ryan. <laughs> there's, the band, there's the current lineup. We uh, Vic can Photoshop my little face in on the side at one point. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, anyway. I mean, this has been great fun, and uh, we got to do a part two, man. We will, we will, and you know what? On part two, we're going to open up the floor to a little bit more questions from the from the people that have been in the chat. You guys. Yeah. Have at one point I'm looking and there's like 600 people watching all the world, you know, and, and it's, it's a very cool thing to know that everybody's hanging out here, interested in your stories. Cause you got a ton of them and the way you tell them. So I, I just want to thank uh, vocalist, saxophonist, harmonica player, and all around legend, Mike Monroe for coming on in the trenches. Thank you, buddy. Now, are, thank can you so much. The people, the, the the very few that might not already be following you on uh, Instagram, uh, where are they going to find you? Is it at Mike Monroe official? Is that where? I think it's Michael Michael Monroe official. I think at that Michael Monroe it. official, and maybe Vic has and that. The, and the up. Facebook, yeah, I guess so. I'm so bad at that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's Michael Monroe official uh, in uh, Instagram, and then. Facebook. I post stuff on Facebook, you know, photos and uh, say hello. You're gonna find stuff. it up, and and of course, yeah. you know, I, I would I, I'm gonna get yelled at if I don't say it again. But uh, please subscribe to uh, our channel right now if you're watching on uh, YouTube or Facebook. If you're just listening to it, enjoy the ride, of course. And uh, Michael, I'm looking forward to a part two. It's been great. Hang on the line for just one second. I want to thank everybody that's been in on the chat the whole entire day. I wanted to really quickly bring these Me guys. Too. Air, that they've been helping all day. Thank you. Hey, Vic. He's been hey, rats. <laughs> rats. <laughs> you know what? We have a project called Sucker Rat Sass. We have a band called Sucker Rat Sass with Sammy and this one guy in, uh, that we did a Dead Boy song once. And the band was called Sucker Rat Sass. So uh, I love the rat name. Rats or Rizzo and all that. <laughs> He's the one responsible for all the Jerusalem Slim questions. So there you go. Okay. Hey, don't worry about it. I'm happy to talk about anything. I just don't want to get into too much negativity. And, uh, you know, life is not all Jim, uh, Jim Dandy all the time. But uh, 
The truth <laughs> be known. The more important, most important thing is the truth. You know, I tell the truth, truth is out. in a house full of lies or whatever. But uh, thank you guys. And that was great really great. That was great. <laughs> Stories are amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, there's tons of those. <laughs> Plenty more where that came from. They're good. Hey, Rat, did you want to clear right, real quick? Rat, part two. What did you well, say? I, I just wanted to say there wasn't a lot of information out there about that, which is why I thought it would make a good question. Now I know why there's not a lot of information out there about that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Now I mean, yeah. Information you need people, I'm glad we... Really I'm, <laughs> well, I'm glad we cleared it up, you know. And, and you know, it's something that people want to know about. Of course, I'll talk about it. I got nothing to hide. I'll just try to try to uh, you know concentrate on a positive more more than a negative, but that was necessary anyway. So, oh, no there. problem, man. I'm happy to offer that information. <laughs> Michael and, is a great guest. He is the real deal. That's the quote I just ha thought of for tonight. So, from I saw that too. That was wonderful. Thank you. Great. <laughs> and, and the and the one thing I want to take over there for everybody and everybody should that's listening. PMA, positive mental attitude, have one. Michael has one. It's proven that it's a legendary to have one. And of and course, rock rock like rock. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys very much for tuning in to uh, the live stream edition of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Uh, make sure you go and follow it. Make sure you go and follow Michael. And thank <laughs> you very much for watching. Until next time, I'm Ryan Roxy. Enjoy the ride. See you for part two.